Hello readers, welcome to reading class with me, Miss Taylor. I'm glad you're here. All right, so we know that when we are reading, there are so many things that are going on in our brains. Isn't that so awesome? So we have been talking about this all year that when we are reading, we are making connections, we're visualizing, we're asking questions, we're summarizing, we're thinking about, hmm, what did I just read about? What was worth remembering? We're predicting, we're synthesizing, we're generating new ideas, and we're inferring. We're kind of thinking about what's in the text, what's in our brains, what's in our schema, and making putting those together to figure something out. And that is inferring or making an inference. So let's keep this in mind that reading is thinking as we continue reading chapter one of King Arthur. So for today, we are going to finish reading chapter one of King Arthur, and then we're going to answer a few questions in our packets about what has happened in that chapter. So for today, you will need your King Arthur book and your King Arthur packet. So our packet looks like this, right? So um, if you would please get your King Arthur packet, we're just going to go through a little bit of what we talked about last time and what we worked on. All right, so we have this little we have this little chart that really helped us to summarize, and it's called a who wanted but so chart. Um, but here we also have the then. Sometimes it's just this kind of a chart. Like you may have seen this in history with Miss Lund. Um, we just added a little column here. So what we read about so far is that the who is K, and that is Arthur's older brother. And K wanted to participate in the tournament. Remember, K is now a knight, and he wants to go to this tournament. And Arthur convinced K and Hector to let him come along, remember? But K forgot his sword. So K told Arthur to go get his sword. It's like, I forgot my sword. Hey, you, Arthur, little brother, go and get one. So then Arthur, he did it as his, as his big brother asked. He went and got him a sword. But he pulled the sword out of the stone. He didn't realize what he had done. Remember, he didn't stop to read the inscription. He's just like, oh, there's a sword. And he looked around. Is anybody? He pulled it out. Just easy peasy. My goodness which leads us to our next question so we had a couple of similes here and a simile is a comparison that uses the words like or as similes are used to make reading more vivid and interesting similes allow readers to visualize or paint a picture in their minds here's a simile from page 15 as smoothly and silently as a snake leaving its burrow the shining blade slid from the stone. So those are the words the author used to help us as readers to paint a picture and get an idea of what it was like and what it may have looked like when Arthur pulled the sword out. So we can get an idea. Well, I know um, I can kind of imagine what it's like when a snake leaves its burrow, its little house, its little hole. It's very easy. It just glides right out. There's no resistance. It's just like, oh, look at the little snake coming out of its burrow. Just very smooth. And that is just what happened, like what happened when Arthur pulled the sword out. In fact, it was so easy, it just slid right out. So for number four, we have what two things are being compared in this simile. So we're comparing a snake and the blade of the sword. All right. And then there's another simile on page 16. Ooh, let's see if we can find that. So on page 16, hmm, let's see. Um, oh, there it is. It's at the bottom. So on page 16, Arthur took the sword from Kay and climbed up onto the stone. The blade slid back in like a warm knife into butter. Oh, so this was when Arthur was putting the sword back into the stone so that he could pull it out again and show his brother and his dad. 
Um, and it was able to go into the stone, go back into the stone, like a warm knife into butter. So if you have ever had that at your house, like there's some, um, there's some butter on the table, maybe you're having some bread or some buns. And if you have a warm knife and you put that into the butter, it just goes right into the butter. So in other words, it's another way of helping us to picture what it was like when Arthur put the sword back. It was just like, went right in, no problem. So that is what we're comparing here, a warm knife into butter and the sword going into the stone. Those are the two things we're comparing here. All right, and let's see, I think we had a couple more questions we were working on, I think number six and number seven, and then we paused, didn't we? Okay, so for number six, it says, what are two things Arthur learns about his family? Ooh, Arthur learns a lot about his family. He learns that his dad was poisoned, my goodness, that his mom is a duchess, he has a, a sister and a half-sister. Wow, that's a lot to learn about your family. And he also learns that Kay and Sir Ector are not like his, his real family. They're his foster family, They're kind of like taking care of him. But um, Ector is not his real father, his biological father. And um, Kay is not really his brother. Can you imagine finding that out? Oh my goodness, that would be very shocking. So number seven, how do you think that makes him feel? And I was thinking it makes him feel many mixed feelings, confused, weirded out, amazed, shocked. I could add a few more things, maybe sad. You know, I would be sad if I found out that my big brother was not really my big brother or my dad was not really my, that would be really sad, confusing, shocking. Ooh, okay. So second grade is what we are going to do is we're going to look at um, a few more questions together after we read the end of the story, the end of chapter one, I should say, not the end of the story. <laughs> All right, so we're going to open up to page 20. And this is right after Arthur learns about his family. So Sir Ector has told him about his family. There were still so many questions Arthur wanted to ask, but he had to wait until they had more time. There were many important tasks to attend to. First of all, they had to decide what to do about the sword. They made an appointment to see the archbishop that same day to explain what had happened. As soon as he had seen Arthur removing the sword again, the archbishop made an official announcement that the true-born king had been found and rushed off to get ready for the coronation. What an exciting time. So the archbishop, it's kind of the person in charge of the church, he announced that Arthur, that they had found the true-born king and that he's getting ready to crown him king. That's what a coronation is. It's like a ceremony where someone becomes king or queen. Oh, this is interesting. Try to picture this in your mind. Think about the other knights here. Most of the knights roared with laughter when they heard that Arthur was heir to the throne. Hmm. So they're laughing. They're thinking it's hilarious or crazy. What? Arthur's heir to the throne? Refusing to believe that this shy young man who wasn't even a knight could possibly be their ruler. Wow, imagine this. You find out that your new leader, your new ruler of your country is a young man, but he's kind of like a boy. He's not even a knight. And he's very shy and quiet. And I think I would be kind of shocked too. Only a few nobles who had survived from the days of King Uther and who recognized the family likeness swore their allegiance. Oh, they said, we will be loyal because they remembered his father, King Uther, and they recognized the family likeness. That sort of means he looked kind of like his dad. The rest were scornful. They dispersed reluctantly, muttering that the whole thing had been fixed and that they'd never swear loyalty to this unknown upstart. Hmm. They're like, oh, who is this child? No, you're not. He's not our king. So the archbishop had no choice but to arrange some more tournaments. He's like, he has to prove himself. Four, in fact. For Twelfth Night, Candlemas, Easter, and Whitsun. Those are holidays. 
when once again anyone who wanted could have a turn at removing the sword. On each occasion, of all the hundreds of knights, dukes, barons, earls, and ordinary people who tried to remove the sword, only Arthur was successful. At the Whitsun tournament, when he had accomplished the feat for the final time, a loud cheer went up from the huge crowd that had gathered to watch the spectacle. We want Arthur, someone shouted. Arthur for king, yelled another. Then a murmur started at the back of the crowd. Little by little, the murmur grew to a rumble and the rumble to a roar. It was the sound of a demand that could not be refused. We want Arthur. We want Arthur. We want Arthur. Wow, I guess after he pulled the sword out of the stone for the like fourth time, they were like, well, he must be the true born king chanted the crowd, stamping their feet and drowning out the groans of a portly baron who had hauled himself onto the stone and was desperately straining to dislodge the sword. So this is funny, if you can imagine, as the whole crowd is chanting, chanting, we want Arthur, we want Arthur. Then there's this portly baron, portly means like kind of chubby, this chubby baron is like a nobleman. He's like, (laughs) straining to pull the sword out. (laughs) Kind of funny. Shepherds were banging their crooks on the ground. Tinkers were clanging their pots. Children were clapping their hands. Dogs were barking. And even the archbishop found himself tapping his toes in time to the rhythm. We want Arthur. We want Arthur. We want Arthur. The huge uproar continued unabated. What's that mean? without stopping, just kept going. Until at last, even the most stubborn knights realized that, incredible as it might seem, Arthur must be their true and rightful king. People were like, it must be true. It's kind of crazy, but he must be our new king. Row after row of knights, lords, and ladies dropped to their knees to swear loyalty to Arthur and begged his forgiveness for having delayed his succession for so long. Arthur passed among them, shaking hands with them and accepting their apologies. When the clamor finally died down, the archbishop stepped forward to announce that the king would be knighted immediately. Arthur was carried jubilantly into the cathedral. Jubilantly, what's that mean? Yeah, joyfully, merrily, happily. Can you picture them carrying him into the cathedral? Arthur was carried jubilantly into the cathedral, and people crammed the aisles to see the archbishop knight him with the sword from the stone. So he used the same sword that Arthur had pulled out to knight him. And that's where someone will kind of kneel down, and then they'll be tapped on each shoulder to be knighted. Oh, remember that from our book about knights and castles? Yeah. A few days later, King Arthur was crowned amid rejoicing and celebration The new king promised to rule justly over his people, to right all wrongs, to drive out the invaders, and to bring peace and prosperity to the troubled kingdom of Logris. That means Britain or England. After the ceremony, there was a noisy procession through the streets, kind of like a parade, with the crowds cheering their new leader along. We want Arthur. We want Arthur. Unseen at the back of the crowd stood a mysterious bearded figure in a long cloak. Is anybody else predicting? Ooh, I'm predicting about this mysterious figure. (laughs) At first, Arthur was unaware of him, but then, as if from nowhere, he suddenly heard a deep, resonant voice echoing inside his head. It's like, do you hear that? I hear something. Many who scorn you soon will serve you. Many called friends will one day be enemies. Yours is a time of wonder, a time of triumph, a time of magic. Rule wisely, King Arthur. You are destined for eternal greatness. Arthur looked all around to see where the voice had come from. But Merlin had already vanished into the night. Oh, it was Merlin. Is that what you were predicting? It's like, where did that voice come from? Oh, oh my goodness.
Who's Marilyn? All right, so second graders, let's take a look at a few of our questions we have. So on, um, on the same page in our packet, we're gonna go through a few of these questions together. It says, how does Arthur prove himself to be the rightful king? Hmm, what does Arthur do that proves he really is the king? Yeah, he pulls the sword from the stone. And I was trying to think about, I think he pulls it out seven times. Because remember the archbishop had those four other tournaments. And so he pulled it out a fourth time, four times then. He pulled it out the first time. Then he had to go back. He pulled it out to show Kay and, Ar and Ector. And then he had to pull it out again to show the archbishop. So that's three times. And then there's four more tournaments and he had to pull it out. So he pulled it out three times plus four, seven times, my goodness. And I think by that time people were like, oh my goodness, he's pulled that sword out of the stone seven times. He must be the true born king. And after he pulls the sword out, what is the reaction of Sir Ector? In other words, what does Sir Ector do? Remember this is kind of, it's like his dad. He bows down before him. Can you imagine if you did something and then your parents bowed down in front of you? You would be like, um, why are you bowing? That would be so weird. All right. Uh, let's see. Number 10. How does the author describe the reaction of most of the other knights? Do you remember what they did? <laughs> yeah, they roared with laughter, didn't they? <laughs> they were like, are you crazy? This young boy is not even a knight. He's going to be our next king. I don't think so. All right. And after Arthur is crowned king, what promises does he make? He says to write two. So these promises that he makes, let's see. So that would be on, let's find our text evidence here. At the bottom of page 22, it talks about what the new king promised to do. The new king promised to rule justly over his people, to right all wrongs, to drive out the invaders, and to bring peace and prosperity to the troubled kingdom of Logris. So he's making a lot of promises here. Let's see, so I wrote a couple of them. He promised to drive out invaders, to rule justly. Maybe I'll add. And to bring peace. to Logris. Oops. So he made a lot of promises. I wonder if he's going to be able to keep all those promises. All right. So second graders, what I would recommend you do, because we went through those kind of quickly, you can go ahead and pause the video and you can write down some of these answers. And then we're going to look at the, the next page together. And the next page is going to be what I would like you to do a little bit more on your own. So you can pause the video and you can write down some of these. Yours don't have to be exactly the same as mine, but they could be. All right, so go ahead and pause the video. And then what I would like you to work on, this is kind of your work to do, is page six. So on page six, this is what I would like you to do for the rest of your reading time today. So here we have some literary elements foreshadowing. And that is when the author gives clues or hints about something that will happen in the future. <laughs> so after the coronation ceremony, Arthur hears Merlin's voice echoing inside his head. Fill in the blanks to complete the prophecy Merlin makes. Hmm. I can give you a little hint. The text evidence for this is on page 23. So I would recommend you take a look at the very end of the chapter. Oops, not 23, 24. On page 24, that's the very last page in the first chapter. Here it is. Many who scorn you soon will serve you. Many called friends will one day be enemies. Yours is a time of wonder, a time of triumph time of magic. <gasps> Rule wisely, King Arthur. You are destined for eternal greatness. 
And then Arthur looks around, but Merlin had already vanished into the night. All right. So you are going to use page 24 to complete this one about foreshadowing. Many who scorn you soon will, no, will soon serve you. Oh, and if someone scorns you, it's kind of like they, they don't want to listen to what you have, you have to say. Oh, it's sort of like, get out of here. I'm not going to, I don't want anything to do with you. Um, so it's sort of the opposite of this one. So if you serve someone, the opposite of that would be to scorn them. Like, I'm not, I'm not serving you. I'm not helping you. Okay. Many called friends will one day be enemies. So those are also opposites. So Merlin is predicting that there's some strange stuff that's going to happen in the future. So a prophecy is like a foretelling of the future. All right. So second graders, I'm going to um, give you a few hints to get you started on this. I'll take a picture of my work. And your job is to finish page six in your packet. And then tomorrow we will start chapter two, Excalibur. Have a great day, readers.